the goal that you're trying to get yeah. to with your career. And that's, that's for me. Location fits into it. So, the long and the short of it is... Yeah, How about at the end of the day, you do anything, you're going to be really fascinated by rituals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to be ethical and to pain and well above. Hi, I'm Owen from RAS Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the RAS Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, Please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoy today's program. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special RASC Live. If you can hear me, say g'day. Uh, it might sound like I'm in a bit of an echoey boardroom. It's because I'm in a bit of an echoey boardroom. So I do apologize. I might bring the microphone a little bit closer to me here. You can hear me. Say good day if you're joining from Self Wealth, if you're joining from ASA, if you're joining from Rask or anywhere on the interwebs. Hello and good evening. Tonight we're talking about dividend stocks and in particular passive income in retirement. So we'll be talking about all of that. Uh, before we get into things, good day, Martin, Mike, good to see you, Karen, uh, Rafaldo, everyone. Who here has read this book um, by Mike Kemp, the, uh, the Ulysses Contract? Mike Kemp, anyone, anyone, any takers? Um, have you read it yet? Um, I would love to know if you have, what you thought. G'day, g'day Matt, JJ, Benny. Good to see you, mate. Mark. Um, and thanks for that, Carolina. I do appreciate it. You can hear me. Great. Uh, if you've read this book, let me know what you think. I think Mike's a fantastic investor and hopefully he'll come on the show in the next few weeks or so. John over on uh, Facebook, hello to you. Um, while you're commenting on the book, The Ulysses Contract, I was just having a quick look at something. Just looking at the um, the stock market's return so far this year, uh, so I'm just looking at the ETF here in Google. So this is the Vanguard Australian Shares ETF, which is the ASX 300. It's up 1.85%, so basically hasn't moved, um, not including dividends. So there's probably 2 or 3% at least in dividends, so 5% return, say. Um, but then if we look at, say, uh, the NDQ ETF from Beta Shares, which is just the NASDAQ 100, so the top 100 uh, stocks in, in the US, um, you can see they're up 44%. So NVIDIA, Facebook, um, Google, Apple, Microsoft, all these companies just absolutely thumping at home this year, 44%. It's going to be one of the biggest returns on record, I reckon. Um, and then if we look at, say, the IVV ETF, which is the S&P 500, so the 500 biggest, you've got 14.5%. Let's have a look at the FTSE. I haven't done any of this in advance. So let's go FTSE 100. This is the London Stock Exchange for any of you that are interested. Um, so it's done, like Australia, it has done bugger all. What about one final one? Why don't we do the Hang Seng? As you can imagine, Hong Kong. Um, index. Um, let's have a look at that. Oh, geez, that's bad. Uh, down 12%. So all in all, if things keep going the way they are, the tech stocks, the big tech stocks from the United States are going to absolutely fly home. Um, and then basically everything else might be a bit of a struggle. Um, okay, so uh, Mike, you've seen the exchange rate. Yeah, let's have a look at the exchange rate really quickly. So let's look at the Australia to US dollar. Um, that's only over the last year. So since the, where are we here? 70 cents down to 64. So that's fallen about you know, 8% the, uh, the index or the, the exchange rate as well. So not good news if you're traveling. If you're traveling overseas, not good news for you. But if you own US stocks, if you own US stocks like Apple and all those, the falling currency is actually good for you because your stocks are worth more in Australian dollars. So um, if you have read this book, uh, great. Yes, Stuart, you said almost finished it. It's a great read. Uh, literally started in my lunch break today, says Matt. Yeah, it's a. this is a fan bloody-tastic book. I'm going to say bloody because I'm Australian. 
And uh, it is a great book. It is probably a little bit more, well, anyone can read it. I'll say that. But you would want to, it's an investing book. So don't go into it thinking that you're going to get like personal finance tips or something like that. It is an investing book. And I reckon it's one of the best, if one of the best, if not the best, one of the best investing books written in Australia. That's what I'll say. Um, I think it's a fantastic book because it covers things like index funds, stocks, how hard it is to mark of time. So even we'll, we'll reference a little bit of this book today. So sorry for those of you that have started but haven't finished. I'll um, ruin it uh, a bit at the end here. But don't worry, there's no spoilers necessarily. Um, let's get into some slides then. Um, before I am uh, found guilty of something, I will give a bit of a, um, if I zoom out a bit here, uh, I will give a bit of a, uh, what do you call it, a disclaimer, which we all love. Uh, me, I just love disclaimers. I just wake up in the morning thinking, wow, these are, these are wonderful. If you are watching on uh, Self Wealth tonight, Rob is not with it. He is actually, what did he say? He was doing something like he was going to some event and he said to say, Owen, I think the event that I'm going to is not nearly as good as the Rask Live. So thanks, but no thanks. But um, yeah, so it's just, just stuck with me tonight. Uh, Stuart, you've said the book makes you want to be a passive investor even more. It does have that flavor, I would say, Stuart. But I think for me, it confirmed a lot of the beliefs I have about index funds and that type of thing, which we'll talk about tonight, but also a lot of other things. Uh, do we get a joke, says Caroline? Yes, we do. But before we get to that, Quick, quick one here is, um, oh, everything is backwards, says Goon. Okay, one second. I'm going to try and mirror my screen. So one quick, one, one, there we go. I think that's better. That might work for you. Is this better, Goon? Can you tell me? Is this not so, this is not backwards? Is this better for you? Please tell me. I apologize. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so have you subscribed yet? Please tell me, please, please, please. Thanks, Mike. It, it's all fixed now, so thank you. Um, have you subscribed? Please, please, please subscribe on RASC YouTube, on ASA, on Self Wealth, wherever you get your RASC Live. Uh, please subscribe. You'll get notifications and that sort of stuff. It also makes my day. Okay, as per Caroline's request, we do have this week's joke. So out of 10, how did I do? Um, pro tip, invest in pasta companies. It's worth every penny. That's the joke for this week. I hope you like it. Pro tip, invest in pasta companies. It's worth every penny. And that joke comes to you from Ultimate Dad Jokes on Twitter. Ultimate Dad Jokes is the handle you need if you want more of your daily fill of dad jokes. Check it out. Let us know. Harry gave me a 4 out of 10. And Jason says, oh, damn, that's terrible. Uh, well, ouch. Uh, but Benny gave me an 8, so thanks, mate. I do appreciate that. You can use that anytime you like. So, okay, so tonight you guys are stuck with me. I was going to get my uh, partner in crime, Drew, with us tonight, but he'll probably be coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, next week, I think it's going to happen next week, is we've got Chris Bates, Australia's number one mortgage broker, who is coming on the live show to answer your questions about everything related to property. There is an asterisk next to this one. You know it's finance. We love asterisks. Um, so... This is really important because we may be recording next week. I will let you know by email. Of course, you should all receive the RASC or Self Wealth or ASA emails next week. Uh, it may be at 12 midday. And the reason is pretty simple. Uh, Chris has a kids and he needs to prioritize them, which is fantastic news. So we may all have to watch it back, back or during the day. Okay, so I'm I said to you I was going to reference a part of Mike's book that I was reading last week when I was in Bali. And at the back of the book, it has this section. I'll just turn off my screen sharing for one moment. Um, at the back of the book here, there is uh, a section where he says, investing is like a farm. And this is a really good phrase for a few reasons. But the next time someone says that the stock market is like gambling, well, they say it's like a casino, tell them, no, it's not. It's like a farm. Because the analogy to a farm is so much more apt than a casino. Most people who go uh, into a casino just guess. And admittedly, that's what a lot of people do do in the stock market because they don't know what they're doing. They haven't read a book like this. They don't actually have the understanding. And the longer you zoom out, however, the more you realize that investing in the stock market is more like a farm than it is like a casino. It's not random. You're actually planting seeds today for something much bigger and better in the future. Or as Mike puts it, and I'm not quoting him here, I'm just paraphrasing, um, over your career, so while you're earning an income, provided, let's just say provided, not providing, this is why I'm not quoting him directly, provided that you spend less than you earn, 
you can buy your farm acre by acre. So every little bit that you save and put in your brokerage account, your, your farm is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, the farm is big enough to support your family or keep expanding by itself. Your stock portfolio is a permanent source of capital. So let me explain what all this means. If you think about building your farm as your portfolio is a farm, it's got all different types of crops or whatever on it. There are so many analogies that apply to the stock market. But if you treat it as if every dollar you put in, it's going to keep growing and keep harvesting and keep growing and keep harvesting and keep growing, eventually your farm gets big enough that it can support you. And that's the whole idea of passive income. You look out the window of your, fa of your farmhouse and you look out there and you see all your crops growing and all your animals or your stock doing its thing. So let's just take it one step further. If you think about it, the word stock actually comes from this idea that we used to trade stock. Stock being cattle, sheep, these types of things. We used to trade stock at the stock market. So that's why we have it. And the first stock markets in Australia, if I'm not mistaken, were set up to sell commodities or, you know, meat is a commodity. It's something you can trade. Um, it was set up for wool and for these types of things. So the very idea of a stock market is from farming. It's from the agricultural community. Things like yield, we get that word from what we used to get from plants. Like if an apple tree grows and it yields fruit or a corn tree or a corn plant grows, it yields corn, you know, cobs of corn. Um, we harvest the stock market for dividends. We harvest crops. There are so many things. This is just what I put together in like 30 seconds. There are so many things. And the first few people to introduce this concept to me were Steve Johnson from Forager Funds and uh, Steve Sammartino from uh, the, Fu the Futurist. And of course, Mike brings it up in his book, but so many people do it. And if you think about it, whatever you put into your portfolio, and this is the permanent part up here, a lot of people treat their portfolio like a lottery machine. They put a dollar in and then they hope some more change comes out, like they hit the jackpot. But if you think about it, the more money that you put into your farm, the more you know harvest, the more harvesting that you do, and then you reinvest the profits back into more plants and to more sheep and to more of this, the better and bigger your farm will be, the bigger, better and bigger your portfolio will be. And uh, Steve Sammartino's idea, which he was taught from a very young age, when he started his own business, I think he was about 10 years old, Steve was telling me this. And uh, he would say that he his first business was actually a chicken business. He, would, he took his money and he would go and buy the chickens that no one wanted. So after the, you know, the battery hens and all those things back in the day, um, he would go and buy the, the chickens that the farmers didn't want knowing that they had a few years left of eggs in them and he would buy them on the cheap and the eggs would be free range just out in the garden eating worms eating grass and doing all that so it cost him nothing to run and then the chickens would produce eggs maybe not as many as if they were in the the you know the, the big sheds but uh, because they were free range the eggs were beautiful so he could sell them at a profit at a premium price and knowing that they cost him nothing and then he would eventually keep some of those profits and buy more chickens and reinvest back into more and more and more chickens and his dad said to him, his dad said, Steve, just be careful because if you eat too many chickens, you won't have any eggs. And then you'll end up in a cycle where you're selling your chickens or you're eating your chickens and eventually you'll have none left. So you have to keep investing some of the yield back into the portfolio. And so this is the analogy that goes on and on and on. But what does it actually look like? So I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, different products like ETFs and that. So I promise you a brief disclaimer and you'll see that come across the, the bottom of your screen in just a moment. Uh, there we go. So we're going to talk about a few things um, and I'm going to talk about ETFs in particular. When we talk about a portfolio, um, many of you will know that recently, or for the last 11 months, um, me and the team at RASC have been working on something that's due to be launched in the next few weeks. And basically what these are, these are portfolios that we manage people's money for them. So in the past, people know myself and the RAS group for providing investment research on ETFs. But soon um, we are going to issue our own PDS and start managing people's money for them. Because we know that for every one of the thousand people who came to our events recently, there's probably 50,000 that don't want to invest in the stock market themselves. So we will help them do that. But in any case, there's one, one of our portfolios that we've built and that we will release. And I can share this with the share the names of what's in this portfolio in a few weeks. I just can't share it now because I'm not allowed to do that. But 
basically what you can see in this chart in front of you here is our version of a 50 50 portfolio for those of you that aren't familiar this is where you have 50 percent of your money of your portfolio in growing things and 50 percent of your portfolio in defensive things so this would be like if you have your your farm you have 50 percent in crops and 50 percent maybe i don't know in something else and the idea is that you have um, so say like you've got 50 percent sheep 50 percent crops and the idea is that both of them can work together and you'll harvest them at different times they'll grow at different rates and they'll require different levels of work and input, whatever. So in a 50-50 portfolio, typically that's considered quite defensive. It's Some people call it balanced. I would call it quite defensive. And the reason why we decided to use a 50-50 portfolio and not something that's even more defensive, so in my industry, like if we go to, let's have a look, Australian Super Pre-Mixed, so if we go to, da, 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 I think it's this one. I mean, no, it's not that one. That's a PDF. And it's, that one's a, that one's a, yeah, another PDF. I don't want a fact sheet. I just want to go to investment options. Yes. Okay, here we go. So what you'll find if you go to a big super fund, say like Australian super, and I don't mean to pick on it, but uh, pre-mixed, this one right here. So when inside your super fund, you'll see a bunch of different options. And so if you go to, most people think when they hit the age of 65 or 70 or 60, they think, oh, I really, I need to go really defensive because that's what I'm supposed to do in retirement, defensive. And I would say that's not necessarily true because when you're 65 or plan to retire, you've still probably got 20 plus years to live. That's statistically speaking, that's good news. So it's still a long time to invest. But if we look at some of the options that are available, so say this one from Australian Super, this one's got 16% in shares there and then 20% there, so that's 36%. It's got a little bit more um, growthy stuff here. So it's got about, what is that, like 40% in growth and 60% in defensive. That's rough figures and it can change from time to time. So it's even more defensive, right? So it's got more defensive stuff in it. Now, what, what we find is that when people reach this stage, it really does depend on what they decide to invest in. It doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, all different types of stuff. Like Australian super is investing in stuff that you and I can't invest in. Um, but <laughs> uh, Justin, you said only just joined. You're on Facebook. You said only just joined. Just put the kids before bed. And uh, already interesting and great analogies. Thank you. Um, Stuart, you said I, I farm and the dividends this year have halved good point they do have and that's why you have diversification sorry not for you uh Stuart, or but you do have it in a portfolio we have diversification so that our portfolios when they go through a drought some parts of it do well and some parts of it don't do as well so i'm sorry to hear that your dividends have halved but um anyway back to this if you look at the dark shaded areas here the areas shaded in gray and black these are the growth side uh, sorry, the, yeah, they're, they're the growth side. And then on the defensive side, we have these different colors. So you can just see it as a representation. It's half of its growth, half of its defensive. Now, when I calculated the numbers for the portfolios that we're looking to build, I calculated that even on a defensive portfolio like this one, I think, this is not a forecast, it's just what I calculated, could be wrong, I think that we can achieve between a 5 and 7% return on average. There are some years like as... Uh, Stuart was just saying there are drought years and there are bad years, one in every five years in the stock market, things tend to go backwards. But if you think about a 50-50 a portfolio right now, if you have a term deposit, well, let's say we get a term deposit, like an ING term deposit rate, no affiliation with ING, by the way. I do bank with ING, but I don't have an affiliation just for full disclosure. But if you get a term deposit with ING, you can get 5%, which is pretty good. Um, it's, they're all about the same, Macquarie, Rabobank, up bank, no, not up bank, U bank, these types of things all tend to offer pretty good rates. But it's about a 5% return. So if you think about that, for part of your portfolio, you can lock in a 5% return. That's pretty good. Um, so to get a 5 to 7% return for a 50 50 portfolio is pretty decent. Um, and you not get, you would still use cash in the portfolio, but you would also have a few other things like maybe some bonds and some shares in there just in case you want a bit more growth. But I think this is a reasonable type of portfolio. The important thing is that I wanted to show you, we're about to talk about stocks. ASX stocks, like Aussie shares that we're about to talk about, should only be one part of the portfolio. I want to stress that really strongly. This is my personal view. 
on investing. And I want to make that very clear that I think Aussie stocks are fantastic for franking credits and dividends and all these types of things, but they should only be one part of your portfolio. And so we see that here is the dark shaded area. The reason is, and I did not plan this in advance, but it's the exact reason that I showed you this before. So if we look at the US stock market, the broad index, that's up 15% in one year. But if we look at the ASX 200, it's 4%, right? So imagine you didn't have any overseas shares and you're just in your big Aussie shares. It would be a, a pretty crap year for you, to be honest. And then what we can also do is we can include some bonds. Now, these won't look very good right now, but I think in the future they might look pretty good, to be honest. Um, and so we can include some Australian bonds. We can include some global bonds. That's, that's right. I got that the wrong way around. We can include some global bonds. Again, just because it's falling now doesn't mean it will fall in the future. That's the key point. So we can include this in the portfolio, but the actual amount that you put in Aussie shares shouldn't be that much. In a 50-50 portfolio, meaning 50% is in growth, 50% is in defensive stuff, so like cash and return deposits and bonds and that, I think 20 to 25% is a reasonable amount to have in Australian shares. Now, if you have an ETF in here, right, if you have a big ETF or you say you have some CSL shares or you have something already in your portfolio, a lot of people, like generally speaking, this is my, I can only speak in general terms, obviously here tonight, I can't give personal advice. But in general terms, what we see is that you, you should strongly consider if you are going to incur tax before selling that previous investment to make a new one. Because sometimes the tax can be worse than the benefits that you get from cleaning up the portfolio. So just keep that in mind. But regardless, all of the Australian shares would fit into something like this. Now, some of you will remember that, um, if I get my little Mr. Squiggle out, some of you remember that if this is your core portfolio around here, well, that's a bad circle, we do have some satellites. So satellites are considered separate to the main core portfolio. The core portfolio should always be very clean and very simple. But the satellites that go around the outside, these can be whatever. You know, These can be really risky bets. They can be whatever. You don't have to do them, but that's an option. Okay, so we just keep moving on. Just that it's, I just want to keep, be very clear that it, you have a particular place in a portfolio for Australian shares, you have a particular place for US, emerging markets, these types of shares. Now, you'll see this is the same chart that I showed you last week. So a lot of people think when they invest in blue chip shares, they're going to get dividends and it's going to be great. Now, uh, I think, I can't remember who it was, maybe Jason, I can't remember who it was a, a little while ago. Um, can you, if you're, if you're, if anyone is willing to share, um, do you own CBA, so Commonwealth Bank, CSL shares, or any of the big banks or Telstra? Have you held them for more than five years? Has anyone held those shares for more than five years? So CBA, Commonwealth Bank, uh, Telstra, these types of names. If you have, pick, if you own one of those, let me know. Let, me, let us know in the chat. And uh, Joe, while everyone's doing that, I see your um, your question here, Dave. You said yes, thank you, Joe. You've said, hey Owen, have you ever heard of a ticker code called QRI? And what do you think of this type of investment, Joe? I have heard of that. Um, so QRI is the Qualitas Real Estate Income Fund. Let me just have a look at this uh, QRI Rask uh, Qualitas. Qualitas, that's, that's it, English Owen, um, let's have a look here. So this fund, just so you know, just for everyone's benefit, um, this fund, Andrew Schwartz, we'll try that. Um, this fund just invests in the debt of property developers. So this thing, this QRI thing that you can invest in in your self-wealth account or wherever you get your, your trading, you can use this uh, as a way to get, I believe it's monthly income. So I'm just going to pop this in the chat uh, now. So this is the QRI interview I did, QRI interview. It's from a little while ago. We don't use this in our portfolio. Um, this is what something that we call, like, this, this fund is something that you can use for income. When I say you, I mean everyone generally, right? QRI as sex. Um, it's the type of thing you can use for income but it's also, it, it's a good product, like it's a good thing to invest in, but it has to be positioned correctly. 
It's not the type of thing that you would go, oh, look at that really high dividend yield. I'll just invest in that one thing. I think that would be a mistake. You want to make sure that this is balanced across other different types of investment, like government bonds, Aussie shares, that sort of stuff, because it's not a perfect investment. I want to be very clear, but it is a good thing. Um, yeah, we don't we don't actually um, invest in this at Rask, just so you know. So, uh, Gavin, you said you own Telstra for 10 plus years. Harry, you've held CSL for five. JJ, ANZ for 30 years. That's it, JJ. It was you. I remember, I think you commented before. Uh, Karan, you've said uh, Telstra for seven years. Very boring. <laughs> Hopes the price goes up. Um, uh, you've got Christine saying yes to CBA. Stuart, you've had Woolworths for 30 years. Stuart, of course, yes, uh, Edwin Nab. Okay, fantastic. So, so many of you have held these shares for quite a long time. That's fantastic. Um, Michael, you've said, oh, and what do you think of the ETF WiMAX top 20 ASX shares? Can you please ask me that towards the end of the show? Because I don't want to get distracted because I could go on a rant about this, Michael. So please ask me towards the end of the show. Uh, Nomad, finally, you've said, own CBA and Telstra for four years, happy with the dividends and growth. That's great. Well done. Um, okay. So the reason why I asked you to bring that up is last week you will remember that we talked about the growth cycle of companies. Last week we talked about companies like La Visa, uh, we talked about Zero, and we plotted the different companies at different stages on the market cycle. So companies experience like a launch period, a hyper growth period, maturity phase. Now, remember to keep in mind that these phases aren't all equal. Even though the distance between these things look equal, the hyper growth phase, what we've found out from the likes of Apple, Facebook, Netflix, Google, all these businesses, is that the hyper growth phase can be a very long period. But the maturity phase, this one right here, can be a very long way. So right out to the right, you can't even see it, it goes that far. And the decline phase, the part where the business is in structural decline, like newspapers or something like this right now, this can actually go on for many years. So this could go on for a decade or more. Um, so these phases are actually quite long. But in any case, I think a very common mistake that a lot of retirees also make when it comes to building an investment portfolio is they strictly look at this part of their portfolio So uh, for, for stocks. So they're looking for stocks like CBA, Woolworths, these types of businesses. And they're fantastic businesses. And if I still, if I held CBA shares for many years, I would still hold CBA shares. You know, it might not be something that I buy right now, but I would definitely have a place for it in my portfolio if I held it already. But that's because a lot of the investors, and I'm glad you all said this, is that a lot of people bought that when CBA was here and it was growing its market share and it was becoming more dominant. The problem for Telstra shareholders uh, is that when Telstra went to, the, to do its IPO, so CBA did its IPO in 1990 or 1991, I can't remember off the top of my head, so it did it many years ago. And CBA was probably something like here. It was a big bank, but it was growing really fast and it will continue to grow for 30, for 20 years, 30 years even. Um, and so CBA, people who bought into CBA during the float in the 1990s have watched it just grow so fast. And all of a sudden their dividends, so we've got revenue up here, we've got the profits going up, so the profits going up here like this for CBA, but the dividends have also gone up. So the people who bought all the way back here have still got massive dividends along the way. Now, a common mistake people make is that, well, I'll just buy CBA today. And CBA will probably still be around in 20 years, but it's not gonna grow the same way. So I wanna be very clear is that when you build a portfolio, not everything in the portfolio has to be growth focused, or has to be dividend focused. There are things that go in a share portfolio that serve a different role. And I'm gonna cover a couple of them tonight. Because what happens if you end up buying into a company that's done really well recently or in the past, it may not do well in the future. And I'll explain to you what you have to look for. But people tend to get suckered into things. They look at things with high dividend yields, not realizing that they're buying right here, right before the thing starts to fall away. And they're called dividend traps or yield traps because they're, people just go for the biggest dividends and don't actually stop to think, well, hold on a second, where do dividends actually come from? So I've got two more slides and then we'll get into the companies. So dividends are not magic. A few weeks ago, a couple months ago actually now, I said how it's magic. The first time you get a dividend, you wake up, you roll over, you look at your alarm clock, you're like, why am I up so early? And you realize there was a notification that came through from your brokerage account or Vanguard and it said, congratulations, you've got a $50 dividend. 
And you're like, wow, I didn't have to do anything. I was asleep over here. And all I had to do was wake up and I've got money. And it feels like magic the first time you get it. And indeed it does because dividends from companies paid to you every six months or every year or every month, depending on the stock that you buy, it feels like magic. But it doesn't just come from nowhere. It's important to understand that even in the Corporations Act, and I did have it up before. No, I've got out of it because I didn't want to bore you to death with it. But even in the Corporations Act in Australia, legally, companies can only pay dividends if that can meet three rules. Number one is their assets must exceed their liabilities, like their debts, right before the dividend is paid. The dividend must be fair and reasonable for all shareholders. So you can't just pay a dividend to someone and not to someone else. It makes sense. And finally, even after the dividend, the company must be able to pay its creditors. So in short, what this means is the company must be a good company. It must have profits and it must be in a reasonable financial position. Makes sense, right? But here's another rule for, for you to consider. And this is my rule. They're optional. There is no requirement for a company to pay a dividend. None. There are rules when it can't pay a dividend, like up here, but there are no rules to say it has to pay a dividend. That's very clear. The, com the company will set that out in something called their dividend policy. They don't have to, like Apple or Microsoft or um, Amazon is a better example or Facebook is a better example. They don't have to pay dividends even they want, they want to. Like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett doesn't have to. He's only paid one dividend. So a uh, good question here from Caroline. Um, actually, I'll just tackle this one from Cameron Faze. Would Maya be in a state of decline? Um, that would be, yes, in my opinion, Maya would be in a state of decline. So Maya has been in a state of decline for a few years. So they would be somewhere in this phase of their journey as a business. Um, let's just have a quick look at Maya's um, dividend yield. I haven't kept up with Maya for about five or six years ever since it's just started to decline, really. Um, let's have a quick look. So we've got Maya... We've got, it's worth $400 million. Uh, da, 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 da. The dividend yield says 9.8%. That's a very high dividend yield. And it could be the case that it, the business can resurrect itself, um, but I wouldn't be betting my all of my portfolio on something like this. I'd want to make sure that this revenue growth that it's reported can continue. And if it can, then buying it could be a good idea. But at the same time, I like to see companies that can I'm very confident in can grow. Um, okay, so uh, continuing on, uh, Caroline, you said, what do you think of the strategy dollar cost averaging into a high yield ETF, then reinvesting the dividends from there into Aussie and international ETFs? I think that's fine. Um, I think that's fine. Like, so um, just so we all are aware, I said in the headline for my email today that um, you can forget VHY. I actually think that VHY is a fantastic ETF for retirees. VHY, it's the Vanguard yield. But the purpose of tonight is to talk about retirement stocks, not about uh, ETFs. But I think dividend this only this ETF, dividend ETF is the one that I like. Um, but I also do like VAS or A200 or something like that. Um, so that's a good question. Um, so, duh, 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 duh. okay, I'll keep going. Keep going, keep going. Um, where am I? Okay. So the way dividends are basically produced, it's not magic. A company has to make sales. Notice how when you asked me about Maya before, I instantly looked at the revenue here in Selfwell. Revenue or sales, it's the same thing. So you can see that Maya's revenue is coming back. So if it has a big dividend yield, the first thing I say to myself, well, is it sustainable? If Because dividend, remember that just for the beginners in the room, a dividend yield is calculated... Uh, so the yield Y equals the dividend, which we sometimes express in dividends per share. So DPS, dividends, dividends over the share price. So dividends divided by share price as a percentage. So if we go back to the overview, it would be the dividend of six cents per share divided by 55, uh, divided by 50.5 cents. So six cents divided by 50 would give you a dividend yield of 9.8%. So the problem is, is you don't know if the dividend is going to be paid next year if it doesn't make enough profits and the share price will probably fall as well. So, okay, let's keep looking. So we've got, the company's got to have sales. You've got to subtract the costs because it's got to, it's got to, it has costs. You've got to pay tax and you've got to pay interest on any debt that you have. That equals your profit, right? And then from that profit, you can pay some of it as dividends. Now, most companies don't pay all of it as dividends. 
Some companies keep it and they call it retained earnings. So it's something that just like goes cash in the bank. So some companies, that even though they produce huge profits, they won't pay dividends because they'll say, well, we're not going to do that. We're just going to reinvest it back into more of our business so we can get more sales and more growth in the future. So that's very common. And that's what you'd want a company to do if it is growing fast. Like if you have a company that is capable of growing at 20% a year, why would you demand that they pay you a dividend? Just tell them to keep reinvesting back into the to the business so they can get 20% growth next year and the year after and the year after. And a lot of people miss that. I was chatting to the, the founder of Behavioral Finance Australia. His name's uh, Simon Russell. Simon um, is a fantastic speaker if you've had the chance to speak with him. Simon Russell, uh, Behavioral Finance. Um, this guy here, and I'll just get him up on Rat. He's written some books as well. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, this, I think it's this one right here. Yeah, okay. So this, I'll just share this in the chat. This is for, um, it's coming into the chat now. I know you're on a bit of delay. Um, this is on the Our Australian Investors podcast. In this, he talks about things that, like, one of the, the biggest biases that retirees face is that they forget that it's just as tax effective to sell a share in order to fund your retirement as it is to receive a dividend. We just have this psychological bias towards dividends. Of course, you don't get franking credits and that sort of stuff. Um, Kieran, you've asked a good question. Speaking of franking credits, from where is the franking credit paid? So this notice how in this workflow, this waterfall here, the company would pay tax, Kieran. So there, at this point, a franking credit would go over to the ATO and it would be stored under your tax file number. So that then when the company pays dividends to you, this is this is you here as a little stick person. Look at that. I can even draw them tonight. There you go. So you then, after June 30th, you go and claim your franking credits. But there are certain rules, right? So you have to be eligible. And then the ATO includes those franking credits to offset your taxable income. That's meant to be an arrow. And there we go. Um, that's meant to be an arrow. Uh, so there was a question before from uh, oh Harry. Uh, Harry, you've said, uh, are you able to comment on whether Rask Invest is in partnership with Waddle Partners? Uh, so uh, Harry, you know that um, as we go, oh, the disclaimer's not up here, but you know that Drew that um, co-hosts the Australian Investors Podcast with me on a Saturday, you know he's part of Waddle Partners. He's a director there. Uh, so is Jamie Nemesis. So they also authorize RAS to give our financial advice. So they hold the license and then we all work together. The RASC Invest service that's coming soon is not part of Waddle Partners. They do their own thing. We kind of operate at arm's length. They do their own thing. This thing I can announce in a few weeks, um, that'll be different. So that's just something that I'm heading up. Um, obviously, Jamie and Drew know about it, but um, that's something that we're doing at RASC and Waddle Partners will still be focused on retirement and doing all that sort of stuff. I hope that makes sense. I'll be able to say a bit more in the next couple of weeks, Harry. I've just, um, it's been a bit of a drawn out process, but I should have the product disclosure statement available in the next two weeks. And then I can share that with everyone um, from when that's a, when that's allowed. Um, Stuart, you've said, what's your opinion of dividend reinvestment plans? I like dividend reinvestment plans. Um, so this, in this instance, you would just get a dividend and it would reinvest in more shares. I think they're great. Personally, I think dividend reinvestment plans are great. A lot of people don't like them. Uh, for example, financial planners don't always like dividend reinvestment plans, and I'll give you a tip why. The reason why, I see Caroline's giving me a 10 out of 10 for my stick figure. Um, the reason why uh, financial advisors don't always like dividend reinvestment plans is because of the admin that they have to go through. Because if, you have, if you're a financial planner and you have 200 clients, Every time they get paid a dividend, each of your clients, you then have to record that and it has to be reinvested. I know it sounds trivial to you and I to reinvest a dividend, but they have to set that up for everyone. And that's why it can be a real pain. So they try and find ways to, to keep things simple. Um, some of them have moved past that and they've got automated systems, but still a lot of them don't have that yet. So I like dividend reinvestment plans. Um, I think they're, they're a good thing, um, particularly for accumulators. But as you get into the retirement, you probably want to take it as cash and have your franking credits refunded. Um, okay, so um, okay, some good questions here. Uh, Harry, you've just made a comment on that. I tend to use DRPs 
or dividend reinvestment plans. If you're in the United States, by the way, I think they've got such a better name for a dividend reinvestment plan. We call it a DRP, dividend reinvestment plan here in Australia. In the US, they call it a drip. I just think that's such, such a better word, isn't it? A drip. It's like drip feeding your investments, drip feeding your farm. Um, so I think that's fantastic. Harry, you said, I tend to use DRPs when it is, um, when it's business, I think has a lot of growth potential and the DRP is issued at a discount. Yeah, so Laser Bonds DRP is a 5%, which is nice to have. So you can also save on brokerage when you do a DRP because a dividend reinvestment plan. By the way, what the heck is a dividend reinvestment plan? So a dividend reinvestment plan is just you take your dividends and it's automatically reinvested and you set that up through your share registry. So that would be like computer share or um, link market services. You know that company that keeps sending you those random letters in the mail and you're thinking, why do they send me mail all the time? That company, that's the one where you go, you go to their website and you log in with your shareholder information and you set up dividend reinvestment plan. And Robert, yes, agreed. A drip sounds a lot better than a DRP. Okay, guys, I'm taking a long time to get to this point. I just keep waffling. Anyway, I want you all, if you can just quickly drop into the chat, which of these companies do you want to start with for us to run through a bit of a dividend checklist? Um, so just put the name in the chat. So we've got Dicker Data, um, or if you're in the United States, you might say Dicker Data. We'll go with Data because I'm Australian. Um, Wes Farmers, Cochlear. Uh, Washington HSL patents, and we've done that a lot, so probably not that one if that's okay. Um, Macquarie, LaVisa, SmartPay, but if enough people vote for Washington HSL patents, then we can quickly run through that. Okay, so da -da -da, West Farmers looks popular. Uh, Harry did vote for Washington HSL patents. We can do that in a sec. Uh, Vagis, you said dividend reinvestment tends to average the cost of shares over highs and lows. Yeah, perfect dollar cost averaging. Um, great, well said. Uh, oh, you said Cochlear, okay, interesting. Judy, you've said DDR, Dicker Data. Oh, this is right. For anyone who, um, I'm gonna just quickly get something up. One second. Um, I've forgotten about something that I needed to say to you tonight. I didn't need to say it to you, I wanted to say it to you. I wanna offer you something that I got, um, where are we? I got something for, um, where is it? And you can get it for free. Okay, wait, where is it? Um, sorry guys, this will be worth it once I tell you what it is and you'll be like, oh, this is fantastic. So I do have something that I may be able to offer you. Um, I'm just going to pop this down here. So just bear with me. I'll be with you in just a sec. I've just got to open in another tab. It's just in my private email. So I can't show you everyone's name because I might get in trouble for privacy and all those reasons. Um, oh, where is it? Okay, by the end of tonight, I'm going to show you something. Um, I do have something that I want to show you and I hope, maybe Lee, if you're watching tonight, can you please send me the link? Um, can you please send me the link? Okay, please send me the link to ASA. Okay, I don't know where it is, but this is what you need to know. Okay. So the uh, Australian Shareholders Association has an event coming up, Australian Shareholders Association. And many of you will know that RASC is the official um, like podcast and media partner of the Australian Shareholders Association, which I'm absolutely humbled every time for that, to say that, by the way. Um, but as part of our platinum sponsorship of the ASA, uh, you, can actually, <laughs> you can actually get... Um, this one, okay, so you can actually use this coupon code. Pretty sure I'm allowed to say this. Uh, you can use this coupon code. I'm just gonna make sure I've got the right thing. Yes, I believe this is the right thing. So if I'm if I'm not, I, I apologize and I will speak to the team at ASA. I'm gonna put a link in the chat now for the Australian Shell Association virtual investor event. And if you use the coupon code, uh, where did it go? RAS Comp, I think it was. Let me just get this up. I think it was RAS Comp. Um, do, do, do. You get it for free. <laughs> so there's only a limited number of seats, but I wanted to put it in there. So this is a virtual event that the ASA has got coming up. Um, and it normally costs a fair bit of coin, you know, 50 bucks. It's a virtual event. It's all online. There's some fantastic speakers. And uh, I'm telling you right now that uh, you can get it for free if you use the coupon code. And I'm just going to confirm it. I think it was RASC Comp. So when you um, set it up, please put in RASC Comp. 
RAS comp. Um, there it is. Okay, I've got it right here. And that gets you the ticket for free. So RASC comp, that's yours. So sorry for the weird thing now. I should have prepared that in advance. It's right there. You can put that in. It is yours, okay? Um, that doesn't work. I apologize. And you can bug me for it next Wednesday night. There's also an ASA um, webinar coming up tomorrow on identifying sectors and trends in the market. So check that out on the ASA website. But you just go here to the ASA website, chuck it in. Bob's your uncle. He might not be um, your uncle, but you get the picture. Um, so Martin, you said ASA survey is about to crash, just like the um, the Vanguard website a little while ago. Um, okay, so uh, just to give you a quick flavour of who I'm, I'm speaking to as part of this. So Steve's going to be there, Danielle's there. Um, I'm speaking to Jim. Um, I've already spoken to Kate. Um, I spoke to Dick at Data last week. Um, I spoke to Seb the other day. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, Pete and Andrew are going to go head to head in property. Ryan, I'm doing a podcast with. Um, there's Jamie there. Karen, who was in the chat last week. Karen was in the chat. That's fantastic. I'm um, doing a conversation with Gurav. And of course, I'm interviewing Richard White, the CEO of uh, Wise Tech Global on Monday. So that will also be included. So basically, RASCOMP works. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. You are welcome. Thanks for taking that up. There's only a limited number of tickets that can be used that way, but um, we get them because RASC is a platinum sponsor of ASA. So I'm super excited about that. Anyway, let's get back to the topic at hand before I get so distracted by everything. But please use it because that's why it exists. The ASA is trying to collaborate with RASC and we're trying to collaborate with them so we can bring more education to ASA and ASA can uh, expand its reach and do all the great work that the team and the community behind the Australian Shareholders Association are doing. Not another property rent. When fantastic. Okay, so I'm glad you guys have all got that. Anyway, let's move on. We're going to talk about West Farmers. So if we're going to look for a company that could have dividend potential, what the things that we want are, and I'll bring up my Mr. Squiggle again, growing sales, because we want, you saw before, you need sales to go up in order for dividends to go up. Um, so you want a defensive business because you want it to be able to pay dividends because it has to meet all these three criteria. You want an aligned management team. Now, this is important. I want to star this one. Uh, Harry mentioned Laserbond before, which is the small cap company. I really, really like that business. Um, you need aligned management. And here's the reason why. If you have a CEO or if you have a board of directors that own lots of shares in the company that they run, so they're like founders or families or they just own a lot of shares, I want you to be very, I want you to remember this. People love dividends. Even if you're a founder and even if you're a CEO, you love dividends just as much as the next guy or gal. So if you can find a family or you can find a CEO that is also the founder, chances are they're going to want dividends in the future. So find them and stick with them. Uh, and so there are all of these. Dick Adada's got a founder CEO. lavisa has got not the founder, but um, a major shareholder in uh, Brett Blundy who owns 40%. The Milner family, um, not the, the CEO, uh, Marty Pomeroy, but the director, um, Carlos, can't remember his surname. Uh, he owns a big chunk of that. Not This is not founder run. This was basically founder run for a long time. This is treated as if it's run by founders. So all of these businesses have like this kind of owner operator mindset, meaning that the reason all of us get dividends is because the, the directors want dividends. And that's why we get them is because dividends must be fair and reasonable. So if the directors get dividends, we get dividends. So um, keep that, in, keep that in, 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 in mind. Okay. Um, oh, thank you for the tip there for Paul. If you're already a for non-members, um, click next and the code goes there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so we want aligned management. We also want strong profits because there's no point a company having lots of sales and then getting it eaten up by costs and taxes and having no profit. It needs to have profit, right? We must invest in businesses we can understand and this is the reason why because if we don't know what we're invested in, we're going to freak out the first time something goes wrong. And finally, we want to buy the shares at a reasonable price because if you overpay for shares, even if it pays a dividend, you're going to be a loser because it's going to go backwards faster than the dividends come in. And I'll give you a perfect example. People are probably like, well, if it's a great company, that won't happen. Well, I want you to have a look at this. This is Microsoft's share price. Looks stupendously wonderful, right? But remember this. In the dot-com era, when its share price was absolutely outrageous, 
It was $58 a share in 1999. That's literally the last day of 1999, $58 a share. Let's fast forward. It fell all the way down to around about $23. And you'd have to go on and on and on. And then by, by nine years later, it was down to $17. So this is nine years after you bought it. It is down by 60% and it is still down nine years later. So much for the world's greatest technology company. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. All of a sudden, it's just the blink of an eye and it's seven years later and all of a sudden your shares are back towards near what you paid for them. And that's the reality. If you overpay for a business like NVIDIA right now, for example, it might be a fantastic business, but is it too expensive? Who knows? Might not be, but who knows, right? If you overpay and you do that consistently, you will probably end up losing money. So you've got to make sure that you're sensible in the valuations you play. So I'll just put that little one there. All right, let's jump into West Farmers. Let's see how it goes with meeting these criteria. So uh, first of all, let's go to the website. I don't know if it's this website, but I assume that they've got this domain name. Okay, so we're just looking for what the business does and making sure that it's A-OK. -okay. Let's have a look here. Let's click on this. So we've got the results. Does it have any information about what they actually do down the bottom? No, great. Let's click on the four year results. Okay, so let's have a quick look. We can see revenue is growing. That's a positive sign. It's growing for a number of years. Uh, we can see that it's also got big profits and they are also growing. Um, we can see, and we, we, we could dive into it if we had a bit more time, but we could find out what type of businesses they own. And where are they? mentioned here no where's the summary here we go so here we can see they own bunnings which all of us can relate to it's like australia's um version of home depot if home depot had no real competitors this is what it would be um bunnings is an amazing business we've got kmart we've got the industrials business we've got office works which isn't as profitable as a business if you go down here for profits it's not as profitable but it's still a good business most people would say uh, it's got an industrial and safety business not really that profitable either but the health side of the business not really that profitable either. So really you're betting on Bunnings, Kmart and the uh, industrials business, oh, sorry, the um, chemicals business. So that's all here. It owns catch of the day, which is not profitable, but that's fine. It's weathered by the other. So in all in all, it's a pretty strong business. Um, and ultimately you would say that it's growing because it's Bunnings, it's betting on housing market, it's got retail, which is very strong. The defensive businesses, you could say Bunnings is a little bit cyclical, but that's okay. Like it would survive. Um, it's a business you can understand. The management team, you just have to take my word for it, is actually aligned. They have good long-term incentives and you would find that out in the annual report. You would search for something called the remuneration report. That's not, that's in the four year results. We need to go back and go to the actual annual report. We'll get it up here in market index. Thank you, market index. Yes, we'll scroll down from market index and we will click annual reports and we'll click on this one here. Oh, I just want the PDF, please, market index. There we go. And we go to remuneration report. And you can see uh, all different aspects of why they are remunerated and you can see how they are remunerated. One of the key things that I look for in every business that I look at is I always look at how long the board of directors and the key management team have been there. The longer they've been, typically that's good for me because it shows a good work environment and it shows that they've got the tenure to back up their growth plans. A lot of CEOs and these types of things these days are only in their job for a couple of years. And that tells me that their board of directors is extra, like doing the wrong thing because they're not incentivizing the board or there's something to do with their workplace culture. I'll give you, and I'll give you another really good example. By now, everyone would have heard how uh, Qantas and Alan Joyce and the business has just been, a, like, it's just been a mess. I think that's fair to say it, the business has been a complete mess. Now, if you think about it, uh, Alan Joyce, this is A for Alan. Alan Joyce should be responsible to the board of directors, but it seems that the board of directors um, kind of just, didn't they just lack the board of directors themselves lacked the accountability to the shareholders because that's why the shit that's why the board of directors is there and so even though everyone's blamed alan it's also fair to blame the board and so what we want is a good relationship between those two parties but not something that's just like everyone's being spoon fed um okay so we've got a lot with west farmers we've got a line management we've got strong profits the way you can look at cash flow 
So even though I said profits before, I just want to double click on another thing. Um, comprehensive income. Oh, that's not coming up. Come on, comprehensive. Surely we're in here. I always use Command F on my keyboard because I deal with so many annual reports. I use Command F. I'm on a Mac. If you're on a keyboard, it's Control F. And it just helps you find key phrases. And I always put in comprehensive because normally comprehensive is the, on the only time it appears in the PDF is when you go to the comprehensive income statement. So I use that just to quickly jump down here. So here we can see um, West Farmers, and I'll zoom right in for everyone, including myself. You can see West Far Farmers has a lot of revenue and sales. It's growing. Uh, you can see where they're spending their money. And you can see down the bottom here that it's very profitable. All right. So that's down here, $2.4 billion. But we also want to make sure that on the balance sheet right here that it's got some cash. Yep, it's got some cash. But it doesn't have a huge amount of debt that's due right now. So it looks like there's no, see this is the debt section. It looks like it doesn't have that much debt due right now. It's got some long-term debt, which is fine. That means that the, if it goes under non-current, it just means that the debt is due after 12 months. So that means they've got time to refinance and do all those things. But if we go down to the cash flow statement, the number one thing that I'm scanning for here is the cash flow from operating activities, this line right here, I want to make sure that that is positive. For me, that has to be positive if I think this company is going to keep growing. It has to be positive. This is basically saying the cash that's coming in and out of the bank account, right? So we take this cash amount and then we subtract the amount that they're investing for the future, cash flows from investing activities. If you have these two figures, that should be positive, right? So I hope uh, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stuart, you've said, uh, Stuart Percival, you said, Alan answered to the board, but it looks like he controlled them. Do you agree? I would agree um, that uh, the reality is that uh, in the board of directors at Qantas, it would seem to me, it's just my opinion, that um, there wasn't enough accountability. Um, Alan, is, Alan should report into the board, not the other way around. Um, Craig, you said Cochlear is a great company. Um, but isn't uh, but its PE ratio is too high. I can talk about that in a sec. Um, CP, you said, how do you assess executive compensation? Do you prefer stock-based compensation? So if you go into um, that's a great question, CP. So if you go into Market Index, one of the reasons that I love the Market Index website. If you haven't already bookmarked this website, go and do it. It's a wonderful website. The Motley Fool also has this, but this one in particular I like as well. So the Motley Fool, all this, they're free websites. You can actually go into the director's interest section down in the page and you can see what the directors currently own. So this is really interesting. You can see it, it's right there, right? Um, and then you can see who the biggest shareholders are. And normally if it says nominees, that means it's like Vanguard or BlackRock or one of those big index funds, just so you know. Um, and so you can actually go through, you can read their bios and you can actually see what shares they own. Now, when I look at the annual report for a company, CP, what I actually look at is I look at, um, I read the remuneration report and I want to make sure that when people are getting paid, like we can see here, I want to make sure that the, not the directors so much, but the executives, I want to make sure that the executives are getting paid in a way that is reasonable. So what I mean by that is like in this case, I want to make sure that they have incentives to grow the profits of a company. They're not just out there trying to you know, we want to sell 1 million shovels this year. If you give someone an incentive at Bunnings to sell 1 million shovels, they're going to sell 1 million shovels and no rakes because that's their incentive, right? It's the same if you have a company and you say to the CEO, I want you to grow sales 100% this year. The CEO thinks to themselves, how can I grow sales 100%? That seems really big. I know what I'll do. I'll go and um, acquire Mitre 10 or I'll go and acquire another company not really giving two hoots about what happens in a few years. It could be a terrible thing for shareholders in the long term. So what we're trying to find out is how do you incentivize people for the long-term benefit because we are long-term shareholders. And the way I like to see this is um, I like to see the, the board of directors set the, the performance of the CEO in line with things like earnings per share, so profits per share, profit margins, and long-term revenue growth, so over like three or five years, not over the short term. Uh, the best example, the very best example I've found anywhere in the world 
for uh, executive and board of director compensation is from a company called Mercado Libre uh, in the United States. So, um, Stuart, you've said, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. Exactly. Um, and so here we can see another dimension. So we'd like to see them rewarded, their bonuses, not just paid in cash, but their bonuses can get paid in shares. So say, for example, in my business, if someone works for RASC for a set amount of time, they will get shares in RASC. But they have to work for us for a certain amount of time before they get the shares. Now, you've got an incentive for them to stay around for many years. So that's obviously the first thing. But with the CEO, you can also say, once you get those shares, then you must hold them for the duration of your employment or for at least five years. So Mercado Libre, what they do is they incentivize their directors and their share and their CEO, and they say, you will get a bonus after X year, but at that point, you only get one third of your bonus. You have to wait another year to get the second part of your bonus and then the third part. So in effect, it works out with Mercado Libre, but that by year five, they actually get their full annual bonus each and every year and it's recurring because they've earned it five years ago, if that makes sense. And that's the, the, the famous thing. Uh, okay, I can see famous here, I see it because of Craig, Craig's quote. And so you can see here that um, um, Scott, Rob Scott, who's got, uh, he would have had um, some options given to him for shares to buy. You can see how many he had and how many he didn't. And you can see how many shares he owns at the end of the year, which is fantastic. You've got a lot of shares in the company. It's good because it keeps him incentivized. Okay, so West Farmers definitely ticks the box. We've probably got time for one more. And I want to do one. I'm going to be selfish and pick one myself. We can come back and if we want to, we can do this next week. If you guys tell me that this is what you want to do next week, we can come back and talk about this next week if that's what you want to do. Um, okay, so I would like to talk about this company down the bottom here because it's kind of going to break the rules. So smart pay, many of you will know, I've talked about it before. Um, da, 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 da. The smart pay is an ASX listed company and it does payment terminals like you would get at say, the checkout of a cafe. So say if you go up to the cashier tomorrow, like say you're here in Sydney like I am and you go down to Marlowe's Cafe, Marlowe's Way or Cabrito Coffee or one of these wonderful coffee roasters here in Sydney and you tap your card, you might see that they have a smart pay terminal. So let's bring this up. Smart pay looks like this thing right here. Um, that thing right there. Pretty simple, right? That's what they do. They clip the ticket. Whenever you you know pay, they make some money. Um, and it's a really good, innovative little business. But I wouldn't say it's defensive because it's got a lot of competition. So it's kind of one of these businesses where you want to be there for a good time, maybe not always a long time. Does it have growing sales? We'll find out. Um, let's have a quick look. Let's go to its annual report. This is the share price over five years, by the way. Um, but you'll see it's a small-ish company. It uh, is a $300 million company, so it's a small company. And if we go down to annual reports, and we go here. Actually, we can do this in Self-Wealth as well. If we go financials and we look at revenue, oh, that's not the right company. Let's go for Smart Pay, SMP. There we go. Um, so if we go revenues here, we can see the company's revenue is accelerating. So it's, it's growing, it's growing faster than it ever has. So that's wonderful to see. Uh, we originally recommended this to our members sometime back here. Um, anyway, so da, 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 da. if we keep going down and we look at profit or net income as it's shown here, we can see that smart pay, even though its revenue is going up, it looks like it's only recently got a profit, right? You can see that there. Um, yeah, so CP said smart pay seems to have done very well, but I'm not sure about its competitive advantage. Okay, so that's a good question, CP. I will say we are unsure uh, about its defensive nature. So if we go, we're going to go, we'll change the color to say, I don't know, blue. So we're going to do smart pay in blue. Right, so it's got rapidly growing sales. Right, in the past, we also need to make sure that's going to happen in the future. So we'd have to do some more research. Uh, we're not sure if it is a defensive business, and I would kind of agree because it does payment terminals, right? Like it does these things. So you would have to do some more research to figure that out. Do you understand the business? You'd probably have to say yes because you can get your head around it if you spend about thirty, well, maybe not thirty minutes, maybe a couple of hours just reading and researching about it. Uh, smart pay, Rask Media, 
one of our old analysts, Patrick, uh, wrote about this ages and ages and ages ago. So I'll put this in the chat. Just keep in mind it's outdated information, perhaps. Um, okay, so we can do smart pay here. Um, so just keep in mind, when you read this, don't be looking at like things like valuations or that, but just look at like how he explains the business. You know, wonderful job. And then you can compare it to what's happened today. Okay, so it's a business you could probably understand. It has aligned management. So if we go, ugh, let me get out of this. Don't like that PDF and a page thing. So if we go down, Carlos Gill, that was it. That's who I was thinking of before. Uh, so if we keep going down, we see Carlos sold some shares recently, but he's bought a lot of shares recently. Um, and if we go down here, we can see that he's a director. So Carlos is a fund manager I've interviewed before. So Carlos uh, is down here. Um, he has 32 million shares. And we can see Marty Pomeroy, who is the CEO, who I've also interviewed. He has 3.4 million shares. So Marty Pomeroy. And I hope everyone here knows I'm... I don't say things like I've interviewed people because I'm being a snob. I only say it so that you can go back and find it in the Rask archives if if you have to if you want to find it later on. So smart pay, Marty interview. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met, I reckon, Marty. Um, there you go. And so, okay, so what we can see so far is mm, da, 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 where was I? Okay, so we can see Marty owns about three point four million dollars worth of shares. So based on the current share price of $1.37, he's got about, I'm just going to eyeball it, he's got about 5 million bucks worth of shares. That's a lot of shares. So he's not going to, Marty's not going to go out tomorrow and just try and blow the company up because he'd be taking his $5 million down with him. So that's a pretty good incentive for me. But one thing that I do want to see is I want to make sure in these smaller companies, I do want to make sure that he is also incentivized for long-term growth. Like he's not just getting weird bonuses that, were, that are good for him and not good for anyone else. So I'm just going to bring up this PDF really quickly. Let me see if I've got the... Uh, I don't know if we'll have the full remuneration report here. Um, so the remuneration report is just a thing that um, tells you how much they get paid in any one year. So, And you can see they go into a lot of um, detail about all their different rules that they have. So here we can see how he is rewarded. And I'll try and zoom in a bit here. So here we can see that he is remunerated or um, the company remunerates people with a fixed, like a base salary, but then you also get a short-term incentive or STI, which is very common, and then you get a long-term incentive. And so what we want to see is we want to see a bit of everything here. We want to see the company, but predominantly I like to see long-term incentives, like they get shares in the company. That's a long-term incentive. And they have to meet certain targets, right? So they might have to meet targets for profits or for growth or these types of things. So the long-term incentive here, you can see, is based on EBITDA or earnings before interest tax. You can see revenue growth and the hurdles that they have to meet each year in order to, to get their incentive. Um, and you can see short-term incentive over here. You can see what they're, what they're incentivized to do. So quickly, um, we want to make sure that we can buy it at reasonable prices. Now, with a company that's growing fast, I saw some comments about the price-earnings ratio. Um, the price-earnings ratio is important. If we go back up, remember that the price-earnings ratio is important. Please go back and look at last week's episode. And we've seen, guys, we saw this, right? What does this look like to you? We've seen the sales go up or the revenue go up, and we've seen the profits go from break even and grow through that. Where would this be on this chart? If smart pay was to be plotted somewhere on this chart, that's the revenue growth. This is the um, profit. Where would you put it? Where do you want me to put my dot? And I'll do my dot in yellow. Where do you want me to put my dot? Where do you think it would sit? Hyper growth, launch, maturity, decline. It's definitely not in R&D, so I won't even bother asking that. Where on this line do you think it is? Please comment in the chat. Uh, Benjamin, you said, uh, how would these fit alongside VAS? So the VAS ETF and the VHY ETF and the A200 and STW and IOZ and MVW, all those Australian shares ETFs, I think are wonderful. Um, remember that um, if you have this part of your portfolio in Australian shares, not saying you specifically, but just generally speaking for anyone that is listening, um, there's... SmartPay is obviously an Australian share, so it would have to be included as part of this. 
Um, that's the way I think about it. Or if you wanted to do it in like a separate brokerage account, you could have Smart Pay and Cochlear and all these as a satellite position around the outside. Okay, so just in the interest of time, I've gone a bit over, but I can see there are some comments here. Um, so Danica said hyper growth, Karen said hyper growth, William said hyper growth. Um, Joe, you said, not sure I would want an STI. Yeah, <laughs> I see you've done a winky face there. I know what you're talking about. Okay, so uh, Paul said early stage three. Okay, so for my opinion, yeah, I would say smart pay is somewhere in here, right? But the thing is, like I said before, all of these different sections of the phase of a company's growth, we don't know for sure how long they'll last. I think this is just my gut feel that the phase of hyper growth for smart pay will actually be shorter. So I actually think it will look more like something like this, right? And the key thing after that is how fast does it fall away? That's the key question we don't have the answer to. Now, I think Marty and the team at smart pay are absolutely wonderful operators. I think they are fantastic and the company does have some growth ahead of it. Um, but it's, the question is not how fast does it grow in one year, how fast does it grow in five years? And that's why, in my opinion, smart pay is a good business, but it should just be as a small part of the portfolio. And so if we go, if we continue back, I will go down to my comprehensive income statement, command F, we can see revenue is growing really fast because they're rolling out more and more terminals, the payment terminals, and they're getting more and more clips of the ticket. And right down the bottom here, we can see that this business has reached a huge inflection point. It has gone from $1.7 million of profit to $7.5 million of profit in one year. That's huge. That's huge growth. And so this is what we call an inflection point. This is where the profits of a business start to grow quicker than the sales. So in percentage terms, that is. So the sales rocket up but the profits rocket up even faster in percentage terms. So we're seeing that happen now with SmartPay, which is a great spot for them, congratulations. So we can see strong profits and cash flow, basically. If we go into the cash flow statement, just go across, we can see strong cash flow coming in. It's paying a bit, but that's okay. So we can see all, it ticks all of these boxes and that should have been in blue, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We can see it ticks all of these boxes but the one thing that we're not sure about is a defensive element. And this is why I say to you, we should have smart pay as a small part of a much, much bigger portfolio that includes all different types of shares, but also uh, different ETFs, different bond ETFs, maybe even some active funds. And then of course, you've even got property outside of that. Smart pay would be like if you owned a 50 acre farm, and you thought to yourself, you know what? I like the taste of raspberries. I'm going to grow five raspberry bushes over there. Don't know if it'll work out, but I'm going to plant them anyway. That's your smart pay right there. But you might have bigger plots of land for your Dicker Data or for your Washington H. Sol Pattinson or your West Farmers. And even bigger paddocks would be devoted to things like the Bond ETFs and the Vanguard VAS or the A200 from Beta Shares or whoever. Um, those would have the bigger plots of the land, um, but you can still fit it all in. You just got to know where it goes. And so in summary, we've covered a lot tonight. We've covered a 50-50 portfolio. Pick up Mike's book if you haven't already had the chance. Uh, Mike's a fantastic individual. I really love his uh, ethics towards learning and teaching. Um, and here's my uh, departing quote for the tonight. And this actually comes from Mike's book, but it's not from Mike himself. It's from Jan John Maynard Keynes in 1938. He said, you, actually, I'll, I'll add some context before I say this quote. You know how some people, when their stocks fall, they think they should sell? That's this quote. Quote, I do not believe that selling at very low prices is a remedy for having failed to sell at high ones. I should say high ones. And the idea here was John Maynard Keynes was a successful investor back in the day. And he was told by his committee or effectively told by his committee um, that uh, he should sell some of the shares that he owned. And he wrote a letter and said, I don't think we should sell shares just because they've fallen. If we were going to sell them, we should have sold them at the high price, not at the low price. Like selling now doesn't equal, doesn't repair what's already happened. And I think this is a really important point. And uh, he later 
got proven correct, of course. So that's why this quote has survivorship in it, but that's the point there. So coming soon, keep an eye out for what we launch at Rask in the next few weeks and months ahead. Uh, I'll be back in the next few weeks. I think I put that up the top uh, right here, secret project. If, uh, if anyone would like me to keep going with these companies next week, we can do this. We can spend a bit of time next week finishing off the other companies on the list. If you want me to do that, please just comment in the chat now. Uh, that'll be fantastic. Ah, yes, WiMAX. Was that the question from before? Um, was that the question from before? Um, uh, Mike, you asked a question. Um, is this competitive period shorter because of, is, is the period of hyper growth shorter because of smart pays competitive market? It's not necessarily that, Mike. It's just that we're seeing a lot of competition in the payment space. So nowadays you can take your Apple phone and you can take a payment directly with an Apple phone. Um, we've seen the likes of Tyro kind of improve their business model. Um, we've seen a few other businesses try and snatch some of that share back. Um, uh, so Harry, you've said, does this only apply for small listed companies? I assume it wouldn't apply to an IPO like ARM. Yeah, so Harry, uh, uh, there's a good question, a really good question. Um, so just because smart pay is small does not necessarily mean that it needs to be a risky company. Some small companies are actually not risk, not as risky as larger companies. And um, depending on the business is how, we, is how I make an assessment of risk. Um, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Ah, so Dave, you just said just checked and smart pay doesn't pay a dividend. That's the number one point. I'll bring this up really quickly. So let's go back to this really quickly. That's the point I was trying to make. I missed the most important point. So here we've got smart pay and we said smart pay was in this area right here, right? The key point is that because smart pay has directors and its CEO and all of its shareholders and it's super cash flow positive, what's happening is this is growing, this is stabilizing, this is stabilizing, and it's getting more profit, right? So what's happening is every time it's coming down to here, it's getting more and more profit. Eventually, I think it will pay dividends or it will keep doing what it's already doing and reinvesting into more terminals and more payment networks and all this sort of stuff. So eventually, it will get to a point where it's either a bigger business, which it already is doing that, or it will start to pay very, very generous dividends. And what gives me a hint of that is that the company has already started paying back. It's already paid back a huge amount of debt in the last few years, huge amount. So I think it will keep um, rewarding loyalty. Um, and that's what I think. So, yes. Uh, okay. Um, Oh, yes, why Max was the question from earlier on. So I don't really like any of the other ETFs, these maximizer funds. So I was asked a question about um, this earlier today by someone else in the industry, and they said, well, what about this ETF? And I always get confused between this one and the Harvester one. So I'm going to make sure that I've got the right one before I think. Um, Yes. Okay. So these types of strategies, the covered call strategies. So basically what happens just really quickly, what they do. So these ETFs, in effect, what they do is they buy a, a core portfolio of shares and then they use options contracts over the top. And so you have this core portfolio and then you have options that go over the top and they use those derivative contracts. That's what they're called, not to give it too, bit, too geeky. And they use those contracts to try and increase the income, right? So you have the core portfolio, which pays dividends, and then over the top, they have derivatives trading back and forth. And the trading of those derivatives is supposed to increase the income. But here is the final thing that I'll say. This is what you can do anytime you're confused. So if you go into something like say, uh, Vanguard Fund Compare, remember we blew this website up a few months ago when we, Everyone got in there and um, we overloaded the website. Uh, that's what I'm going to try and do right now. So Vanguard Fund Compare, YMAX. And I'll compare it to another beta shares fund, which is just the A200 ETF. So this ETF here is the YMAX and this one is the just the vanilla one. Okay. If we go down and if we have a look over time, so we've got the beta shares, the vanilla one on this side and the other one on this side. Over five years, the vanilla one has one. 
um, get this out of the way. Over five years, the vanilla one have won. Over three years, the vanilla one has won. Um, now, over one year, the ETF, the this strategy has won because the stock market, as we saw earlier on, has had a bad year. So the only time in my history that these types of strategies work uh, is when the market is kind of trading sideways, which is not that often. Um, so for the long term, the thing to focus on is not the income that you get, it's the total return, the growth plus the income. Because if we look at this, I'm going to show us, let's have a look. Where is the share price of this bad boy? It doesn't show us over time. Oh, here we go. So if we zoom out, we see the share price. It looks decent, but over five years, it's not that impressive. But if you looked at the A200, you would see that it's much more impressive. So in short, the answer is for these types of weird and wonderful things, I don't think they're that worth it, to be honest. That's just me. So anyway, that's me for tonight. Thank you, everyone who hung around for a little while. I can see a few people wanted me to come back, do the same thing next week. I just realized I still owe, owe you the um, the valuation spreadsheet from last week. I was supposed to do that today. I will give you the valuation spreadsheet from last week. I'll, give the, I'll upload that before next week's session, so I apologize. All right. I will see you all in a about a week's time next week. Um, if we're going to do the dividend one next, uh, this value, the dividend one next week, we'll push Chris back another week. So the mortgage broking might be another week. Have a wonderful evening, all. Mike, if you're drinking vodka, drink responsibly. I think that's what the ad says. Have a wonderful, a wonderful uh, week ahead, and I will see you next week. If you haven't already, go and pick up this book. It's not for absolute beginners. It's for people like us. Go and pick it up. It's a wonderful book. It's a good investment. Buy two if you want to support Mike and give one to a friend. Okay. Bye for now, guys. I'll see you. I'll see you when I'm looking at you, I guess, in about a week. So bye for now and see you then.